Hi, I'd like to welcome Jan Timman, an old friend of mine. And thank you very much for being here with us online only. Unfortunately, I would have loved you to be in Budapest this year at the Global Chess Festival. But uh, even this is something very special for me and I think for the audience. Welcome. It's also my pleasure, yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you, what age were you when you got attracted to the game of chess? What was the hook influenced you on that? Well, actually, uh, there was a tradition in my family. My father was a mathematician and he uh, played chess. He had already the openings books of uh, Max Oeuvre from before the war. And uh, my older brother was a very uh, fanatic chess player. And he actually uh, taught me to play chess. He forced me actually to play chess. And how old were you? I was eight years old. He well, later regretted that because I became better than him. And uh, yes, that was a bit frustrating then. <laughs> this is what happens when they teach a smaller kid. I'm the smallest in the family too. <laughs> yes, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Well, if you just mentioned uh, Ove, then let's see a picture from old times. And uh, do you remember this special occasion? For me, it was very touching, this picture, because Ove, the fifth world champion, I'm sure it must have been something very special for you to receive, I guess, is it the first prize? Well, actually, this is a picture from, uh, if I remember well, from Leeward in 1970. So I was uh, 18 years old here, and I received from over the first prize for winning the Blitz Championship of the Netherlands. And actually, over participated himself, and I beat him in our Blitz game. And what was your relation to, relationship with him? Was he a nice person who supported and mentored a younger generation like you? Or uh, how did he behave? Because I think this is always very special, how the big guys, the, the really big champions treat the younger gen generation. Well, actually, we didn't talk about anything uh, chess technically, but he supported me a lot. He uh, was a member of the so-called Timon Committee that uh, should help me on my way up, on my way up to the top. And he uh, supported me financially. Uh, he put a lot of money in there. And he was a very uh, kind man and I had very good contact with him. Actually, he knew my mother very well because he was a pupil at, at, uh, at the high school. He was teaching mathematics and she uh, was his pupil. Oh, okay, so you had a very special relationship, your family with Max Herbert. Yeah, sure. When my uh, father died, uh, Erwe sent a, a, a long letter to my mother here for uh, condolences. Well, this is uh, fantastic to hear this and uh, he must have been a special person as well. But later on, you had your great years, amazing uh, career. You were, if I remember well, the first uh, Western player who reached into the top 10. And the next picture I like because there was a switch, right? At this point where this picture was taken, there were another generation coming up in the, the Netherlands. Behind you can see Piquet and you're analyzing with Luc van Valley. So how was it to be on the other side, being the great champion yourself and seeing the newcomers uh, coming on your neck? Oh, well, I got along uh, very well with uh with Piquet and Favelli, especially for, uh, Piquet. Now, at, at this moment, I don't see Piquet that much, but I see Favelli more often. And, uh, well, he invited me last year to play in Hoogeveen. At that time, uh, I saw this actually as a, as a kind of a way to stimulate me to, to, to achieve uh, successes, even at a higher age, because uh, I kept uh, first place on the ranking list till 2001 in Holland. I was still ahead of uh, uh, Favelli and Piquet then. When I was yeah, well, the this picture, what we see, of course, it's definitely from uh, years back, but not necessarily because the picture was taken so long time ago, but also as uh, nowadays that we're living this very special time of the pandemics where we have no tournaments, uh, it's clear that this is something could not happen, even though 
when we have tournaments running, it's not so obvious anymore that after the game you share your thoughts and you analyze uh, sometimes even hours to share uh, the ideas. I actually myself, I love the, this period when uh, it was after the game, you, you could share your thoughts with your opponent and not that what is happening now, you just go to your room and ask one of the engines what, what was wrong and where should I go better? Yeah, that's the problem because nowadays it makes uh, very little sense to have this post-mortem after the game because uh, you can suggest this and that and you can say what you were thinking about but it may be refuted just uh, when you reach your hotel room uh, when you <laughs> put on your computer and that is a pity actually i, I think that uh, almost all world champions in the past that i played were also very kind in analysis uh, I analyzed together with with Tal, with Spassky, with Swislov. Uh, I never played Fischer, but I understood actually that Fischer was the only one who never had the post-mortem. He immediately left after he played the game. This is what Robert Hübner told me. Well, uh, yeah, I think uh, we were learning a lot by having these uh, post-mortem analysis and not only by uh, having the analysis, but also when we were just standing by next to the board and seeing, I remember visiting Vaikanze and other uh, top tournaments and I was uh, like watching the big guys analyze and you could really feel the, the passion for the game, the knowledge, the, the, the way the, the big guys were uh, really thinking and how they were analyzing, how fast they were. So it was a very special per period for me as well. And then later we, uh, somehow started to work together. You remember probably as yeah. well. It was somewhere in the second half of the 90s, if I remember. And uh, it was a very special time for me. It was very special to work with Jan Timman, the big champion. And, uh, and of course, we were time to time, we were also competing against each other. But in those times, uh, you were also visiting Budapest quite a few times and we had uh, some nice analysis. I even won some games, I think, according to our an analysis we made. But it was also very clear that we were both very passionate about the artistic part of the game. And uh, well, for you also, like art and beauty have always played a, a prominent role in your career, right? One of your first book actually was called the art of analysis. So how can you define, how would you describe uh, the art in chess? Well, I, I don't know. I think that uh, chess, of course, is in the first place, it's a fight. Yeah, You have to try to win. But uh, I have always uh, been a lover of uh, all aspects of chess, for example, end game studies. You see a lot of art in end game studies. We will probably talk about that later. And, uh, but in general, also, uh, when I was uh, selecting my 100 best games, I was looking actually for, for games that, that had some element of surprise, so something, uh, something elegant in the, in the games. And uh, I've always uh, looked for that in my entire career. And I remember this photograph. This is from Hoge of Fame, uh, 99. I still didn't have gray hair at the time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Can you, the, would you say that chess players could be called artists or would you say yourself that you're a chess artist? In a way, yes. But once I met an artist and he said, you have a great profession. You're just thinking and you earn your money by thinking. Because he had to do a lot more to earn his living. He had to do all the strokes, the worst, worst strokes on the canvas was much more <laughs> troublesome than making moves. So in that way, it's not an art. But I mean, if you just look at a chess game as a, as a composition, as a, a, let's say, a composition of music, then I, I think in general, I think the, the compositions, the, the chess studies are more like compositions of music. But you can also see games that have this element. But I believe that there are not too many games where uh where you have the full clearness, pur pureness of a study. Actually, for me, I was also composing only very few, nothing to compare to your uh, active uh, compositions. But for me, it always came by and the idea of uh, 
playing a game. For example, I made a study out of a game which I played against Shirov in 96. So how do you, where did you gain your passion for studies, for compositions? When was it in your life? I think this was uh, already uh, in my uh, teenage years. I, uh, I, I liked all the books on the endgame studies that were available at the time. I think I made my first study in 1970 when I was 18 years old. That was actually the same period that, uh, that I got this prize from Max Uber. And uh, at the time, I, I didn't make any great studies, but when I was over 30, I, 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 had my, I won my first, first prize. And actually, uh, Paul Benko awarded this first prize to me. I find it very I find it very interesting that for example when I was a kid I loved studies and uh, only now some in the last year or two when I bump into more and more studies again because uh, well I'm a retired player myself but still I follow all kind of social medias and there are a lot of studies and I'm happy that you were sending me some as well and of course in the chess magazines I uh, I follow the studies my favorite was uh, Banco, for example. I loved when I was a kid, I loved Kupel, I like uh, Troitsky, I like the Reiti. But I felt nowadays, I specifically have a feeling that actually it did give a lot to my artistic chess, what I was uh, showing on the chessboard, because I was somehow always looking, first of all, for perfection in some way that things work. And also I had in my head that when I was calculating lines, I always wanted to make it work. And by solving those problems, I knew it exactly beforehand that maybe it's going to be very complicated, but I have to still move on and try to find a solution because there is going to be a solution. And I think I had this many times during the game, but I was not aware of it for many years. Uh, first of all, my question is, who is your favorite composer? Well, you Just study Kubel. composer. You, you mentioned Kubel. Actually, Kubel is also one of my favorite uh, composers. Also, uh, Korolkov, Bron, uh, Evreinov, a lot of uh, old Soviets. And of course, nowadays, uh, Oleg Pervakov, who celebrated his 60th birthday, he's absolutely the best at the moment. What do you think? Let's see. I would like to share with the, our audience also one of your studies because, uh, well, I think you are just making some of the most amazing studies as well. And uh, let's see this one. Maybe you can say yourself a few words about uh, this. Yes, I made a study in uh, February uh, 2018. And uh, I worked actually quite uh, hard on this. I had different versions and I finally found the most satisfying. I, uh, I just got new ideas and I uh, got the best version out of it. And I decided to send it for uh, the, the banker uh, Jubilee Tourney when he uh, became 90 years old. Can you tell me the process you're doing during making a composition? Because the composition is practically an artwork of having every single piece on the perfect square, where if only one piece would be standing somewhere else, then the whole study would not be uh, good. It would not work. So how, where do you start to composing a study? And when do you feel that, OK, this is the best version of this idea? It, it's not always possible. And it, you, sometimes you feel that's the best version, but uh, you, you may uh, come back to it later and then you find a better version. But in general, uh, you, you work backwards. You, so it is some sort of retrograde uh, thinking. You have some sort of idea of the final position, and then you uh, try to make, uh, to, to, to think what, what was White's last move, what was Black's last move. And you have to ask yourself this question all the time. And by doing this, you make the study. And actually very uh, important is the computer nowadays. I think the studies of these days are of a much higher level than in the past because of the aid of the computer. I think that uh, the general level level is, is, is really high nowadays. You cannot uh, 
come up with the old ideas. Actually, I forgot to mention one study composer, this is Mitrofanov, who, uh, who has uh, made one of the most amazing studies ever. So in this study also, you want to say that you were starting out from the final position, which we are going to be seeing in just in a few minutes, and then you started to go backwards, building it up? Yes, yes. So now actually, um, one of the ideas that uh, the rook sacrifice, which you are going to show soon, that rook sacrifice was more or less well known, but in a different position, and uh, not with the same consequences, not with the same uh, fine uh, points and uh, and other uh, finesses. I think that the study is very complicated, and uh, there are all sorts of aspects that I think are, are not so easy to understand. But uh, this this study actually gave me the most pleasure of all the studies I made. Well, I had the pleasure actually seeing it for the first time by your presentation last year in Amsterdam, and it was great fun uh, when you were showing it. As it is so difficult and so complicated, I decided to show it only from the halfway of the study and uh, whoever is interested about it, they will be able to search it. I think you can find it in many different places. Also on the online festival, we're going to present it in different platforms. So let's see, this is more or less after 10 or 12 moves uh, were played and it was a simplification where black just queened a1 and now it seems like that white has to make a draw but there is an amazing beautiful solution which i think this is what you were referring that this is something similar was produced before and it is rook h1 yeah the now rook if... h1 move, yeah, let me say, say something in between this, it, it, there's a Russian composer, Makletsov, as a, as a study with this move. Okay, so after queen e1, white would be giving a check on e5, which is actually a checkmate. So black has to capture with the king. Bishop takes a1, and black might think after h2 that, well, actually I'm just in time to save the game. But you have a move king g3, king g1, bishop d4 check and still black can think that after king h1 that white does not have enough time to win the h2 pawn but how to move forward right so this is not so difficult anymore but uh, it is very beautiful at the same time bishop c5 takes king f2 white has to make this move because otherwise king g1 would be going out and this way, everybody is making, well, black is making the only moves, but actually white queens first and gives queen a8 mate. I thought it's, uh, it is a really wonderful uh, study. So how long did it take for you to develop it all the way from the beginning until then? How much time did you have for this competition, which actually you forgot to mention that with this uh, composition on the Banco's, uh, uh, birthday, 19th birthday, you actually won the first prize with this one. Yes, that is true. Yeah, I, I worked uh, very hard. I have different versions that before. So I have all this uh, in my computer. You see, let's say at least 10 uh, earlier versions uh, of the of the study that were not as good as, as the final uh, product. So actually that is also asking uh, answering your previous question that you asked before. Uh, sometimes, yeah, it takes a long time before you finally got it right. And I think, well, I, approximately, I think I worked 10 hours on this study, at least. Only? I thought you worked much more. Sometimes, Genius. yeah. But, <laughs> it, it depends. But I think on this one, I, but sometimes I, 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 make, I make a study in two hours. And what this is the stage? What is the stage when you use computers? When once you develop an idea and then you go to double check it, or you are using yes. it on different parts of the creation? Well, the point is that the computer is, is very flexible. You can, let's say you have a certain idea and then you you can adjust the, the square of the piece. Let's say the bishop is on a certain square, let's say it's on b6. Then you think, well, maybe now it doesn't work. Maybe it's better on c5. And, 
you you can do this very quickly with the computer. I cannot imagine that I made studies without a computer in the past, because the, the computer is very valuable here. And uh, this this is actually the process. You you just go through it very quickly with a computer. But but some part of this study actually uh, took me quite a long time just to realize the idea. But uh, but I, I said ten hours. This is an estimate because I didn't make this study in one day. I made it, in, let's say, in one week. Time. So and I spent all my time on it. But uh, on the other hand, sometimes uh, I forget time. I forget that it's uh, time to, to, to have dinner or to drink a glass of wine because I think <laughs> with a study. And what do you think? Did uh, the engines gave uh, the what engines gave the help to create a study? Did it take away any uh, any good feeling to create a study, or did it take away from the feeling of the creativity making a no, study? Because it, you say no. it, it is became easier in some ways. Yeah, but I don't think it takes away the creativity because the, anyway, the the, 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 the um, computer can compose end game studies, but not, but not very refined studies yet. I mean, sometimes uh, even the, the the table base gives positions uh, that, that are. Uh, actually a study and, and some some composers use this table base a lot they use all sorts of mutual zugzwangs to get to the best uh, version of a study but normally i don't do it that way I, I i work with the computer but sometimes in the final product so let's say i have the, the starting position and i give it to the best computer i give it to uh let's say stockfish 12 and he cannot find it and that's very funny they cannot uh, find it no I can give you, I, I can send you a file with studies and you can just use a very strong computer and it's helpless. Well, so this study I think is like uh, 30 moves or something. Yeah, yeah, well, it takes some time. I think uh, the, the computer needs uh, at least 20 minutes to understand it. And how do you feel that uh, if, let's say, uh, there is there are quite a lot of talented uh, players right would you suggest to youngsters to to compose a study or solve studies what do you think how much it can give for the competitive uh, chess does it add something well i know for example that Firuja uh, loves uh, studies and uh, i think it helped him a lot yeah to uh, to become better and i think in general it's a very good idea to, to, to compose studies is even better, but I think it's very complicated, very difficult. I think that actually you should try to do it now that you uh, are not active as a player anymore. You have some good studies and you can do it again. Well, uh, actually, to be honest, uh, I'm enjoying to solving them. Sometimes I see it in the morning when I wake up, I see one and then I have it during the day in my mind and uh, thinking about the solution. So it is something uh, special, I think, in chess, and it's kind of a pity that it's not recognized much better than it is. But uh, I hope to do something uh, in order that it gets a bigger recognition, because I think it's a, it is a real artwork to make a composition where everything is just perfectly matching and every, everything is just there where it should be, right? Yes, that is, that's mostly the case, yes, true, yeah. Sometimes uh, you can choose, uh, be, you can just um, put one piece at a certain square on the diagonal bishop, for example, could also be on a different square. But for example, this composition, everything should be just at the right place. And that, that is actually, that counts for the best compositions. What is very important is that all pieces play. Uh, so it should be a very lively composition. Pawns is not so important. Uh, well, looking back into your uh, rich career, uh, you also had a lot of books written. I think we just discussed uh, before the discussion that it was uh, you wrote more than 20 books, which is quite amazing. You're, you're a very special author. You're also uh, having a monthly or, or two monthly column in New in Chess for, uh, I guess, for decades already. And uh, you just wrote a new book, which just came out with Tim and Stream selected 100 games, but which was kind of uh, interesting for me as I got to know that 25 years ago, 
you wrote already a book of your 100 best games, right? And it's only 10 games which is overlapping to that. How did you make the selection for your uh, latest book? Well, my previous uh, book, uh, Selected Games, was 80 games. And it was from one period uh, between uh, 1983 and 1994. And now okay. when I made a, a new selection, uh, yes, I had only uh, 10 out of these 80 games because uh, the computer actually uh, taught me some lessons. Uh, the, the previous selection was actually not entirely made by myself. It was mostly uh, what I had analyzed in the magazine and uh, put together in a book that uh, our uh, editor at the time wanted that. And I think that the selection was not as precise as I have done now. And I think that the 100 games, uh, the selection of 100 games was actually very difficult. I had a, a lot of trouble because uh, normally it is much easier to make a selection of 200 or 300 games for such a long career, you have many games that that are pleasant, that are interesting, and yeah. But after the computer had uh, refuted some of these uh, beautiful games, at least I thought they were beautiful, then I was a bit uh, disappointed, obviously. But on the other hand, there are some games that I thought were not so uh, convincing at the time, and they were just a bit messy, just chaotic. It turned out to so, be very good games. So what was your uh, criteria by uh, selecting the games? I remember I was writing my own book. Actually, uh, I ended up writing a trilogy because I couldn't make a yeah. <laughs> uh, proper selection out of 100, I must say. So how did you make it to end the selection? What were the criteria that actually the games ended up in, uh, in the book uh, being published? Well, one of the criteria was that I shouldn't be uh, clearly lost at some stage. I mean, I, I think that the game is not very good if, if you if you are lost at a certain moment and, uh, and you finally win anyway. I made only one uh, exception. That was my second match game against Kochnoy in Brussels 91. Because that game was so complicated and so interesting that I uh, decided to include it. But, but there are other games. For example, I beat uh, Galfant in Tilburg 1990. At the time, I thought it was a great game, but then I realized at some point that Galfant uh, in the middle game had uh, probably a winning advantage. And then I didn't like the game that much anymore. And then, for example, I had another game against Galfant that I beat him in back in 2002. But I thought it was too theoretical. So you see that. I wanted to have fresh games, you know, not too much theory. Yeah, we see our games in uh, with different eyes uh, in some years. And of course, when we start looking at it with engines, of course, it completely gives a different dimension. Well, uh, we are giving out prizes to personalities, the Judith Bogart Chess Foundation, the Goodwill Ambassador Award, for those people who we appreciate so much with their career and what everything they give to chess and they are real ambassadors and I believe that uh, you're a great ambassador of the giving the passion of chess to everybody and specifically the being the goodwill ambassador of art in chess because not only in your games but you in your artworks in compositions, you did such a great job and you gave so much to the world and we still hope that you're going to give a lot more to us in the next decade. So we would uh, like to give you this award and also we are going to post you a little uh, trophy with it. Uh, we are going to post it to Holland and uh, we are really grateful that you were here with us and we could give this award to you and uh, congratulations with all you were doing. And I hope a lot of people will uh, read your book because uh, many of your books are great, I must say. I also like uh, the art of uh, chess analysis and also about end games, your writing books. And uh, I just want to ask you, uh, what are you up to in the next uh, upcoming year, let's say? You just finished your great book, The Timmons Triumph. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for this uh, award. I'm very pleased to get this. And uh, 
yes, I will give it a very special place in my home. And uh, well, at the moment, I'm I'm always busy. I'm writing a, a book mom at the moment uh, that uh, that I I mean I cannot dis disclose uh, at the moment what it's about. But uh, I write for New and Chess. I write for the Yearbook. I write for the magazine. And so um, I make endgame studies. Uh, I sent endgame studies to attorneys. I had a lot of first prizes, and I hope to win a lot more. I'm very well, curious what will happen with my uh, two studies that I sent to Pervakov for his 60th birthday. The verdict will be uh, the 1st of October. Well, uh, I wish you good luck on that and with composing a lot of great things and writing a lot of great books. And we will continue our discussions in the future, I think. Congratulations and very much, thank you very much for being here with us. Well, thank you very much, yes. It's my pleasure as well, yes.